Happy Tuesday, pro-life family. Welcome to the table. So we're all having these weird cultural conversations about the pro-life issue these days. Time to up our pro-life activist game. Rachel Bush is gonna join us today to talk scientific words about when life begins and how to have these conversations about personhood. So grab your coffee, let's get started. Happy Tuesday, pro-life family. Welcome to the table. I got my coffee, you got your coffee. I'll pull up a chair. So, joined by Kim Schwartz, Media Communications Director, and Rachel Bush today, Woo! who's Education Director almost, transitioning into the role. Almost. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome to have you in from the from the North Texas DFW office, Thank hanging you. out with us, because the fellows are here, they're doing training, they're getting awesome. smarter and more activist. Yeah. D, yeah. Up in their game. They are. They're hearing all kinds of awesome talks this week from pro-life experts, and uh, they're getting ready to go back to their campuses in the fall to save lives. I'm seeing some cool, like, famous people walk down the hall, mm -hmm. like pro-life famous people. Yeah. 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 It's pretty cool. I remember whenever I was a fellow, like, that was my first kind of experience in becoming a pro-life expert. That's what, uh, so our college students, we have a college scholarship program. They come to our office for uh, training, kind of like what we do on this podcast. This is just like a little like entry level into what right. we do with these kids um, throughout the entire year, but especially during this week. And so I remember whenever I was first, just like a baby in the pro-life movement. <laughs> um, I was like 17 or whatever. And I go to the fellowship training and I remember the question being pointed so directly about the heart of, you know, making the pro-life case is just asking, what are we aborting? And so you'll hear, we have these conversations all the time about like, your friend will say like, oh yeah, I can't believe all of the Supreme Court stuff. Like Roe v. Wade is great. And I support a woman's right to choose to do with what she wants with her own body. And we have to ask the right to choose what? Absolutely. What are we? So you're choosing an abortion. Say the word abortion. What are we aborting? And so we have to then ask the question, is the fetus, is the embryo, is the unborn child a human being who is alive? And Rachel's going to help us answer that question. Yes. yes. Okay. I'm happy we can have yes. this conversation. We talked last week about, you know, we're having these conversations. They're front, forefront of culture right now. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to discuss, we'll start with when life begins. And so we can talk about what, what are we aborting? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think it's important to know that biology is very clear on this. Um, at the moment of sperm egg fusion, to get kind of sciencey, um, at the moment of that the sperm meets the egg and conception or fertilization occurs, there is a brand new human being at that moment. That is the moment that human life begins. And biology uh, is really clear on this. Open up a biology textbook, go to your local library, check one out, and the textbooks agree that something really special happens at fertilization. And that is that human life begins at that moment. Yeah, there was a study, I was looking at this recently um, to talk to my youth ministry kids about this because they're having these conversations at school. And there was a study in 2018 that said 95% of biologists agree that human life begins at fertilization. Uh, and so you might not be a Supreme Court justice, but all the biologists agree that uh, human life begins at conception. And, um, I watched a movie recently too with uh, this great pro-life apologist named uh, Stephanie Gray Connors. We have her at some of our events. And she said that outside of the question of abortion, there really is no uh, question of when life begins. Everybody is pretty consistent and pretty in agreement with this. But because like abortion is this like uncomfortable topic, people will kind of muddy the facts. But let's say that there are uh, there's a veterinarian who's trying to breed horses or a horse breeder. I'm from a farm, so this is what uh, happens quite a bit. So like whenever you're trying to have um, your a dog breeder or a, a horse breeder or whatever, there's no question on when does a horse become a horse? When does a dog become a dog? Everybody knows that like, oh, a horse is pregnant with a horse. And that is a horse in the uh, very early stages of his or her life. But 
that's a horse. Um, and so even with uh, in vitro fertilization, there's no question on, well, we've just fused a sperm and an egg in the science lab here. There's no question on like, what did we just create? I don't know. They Guess know. we'll have to wait and see and right. see what happens. Ooh, right. Surprise. So there's no question on that. But once you start talking about abortion, people start muddying the water. So hmm. tell us more. Yeah. So uh, there are a few really important things that happen at that moment of fertilization. Um, some markers that we can look at to say that this is a brand new, um, brand new creation, brand new life, brand new organism. Um, first of all, uh, at that moment when that new human life is created, there's a brand new blood type that's totally separate from the mother, um, unique DNA. Um, you know, if we were to go in and look at that tiny blastic blastocyst, if we were to look at their DNA, um, it would be distinct from the mom. We would know this is this is something new. This is not just um, an extension of of the mother. Um, we can tell the gender um, or the DNA can will already determine the gender of that child that has just been created. Um, and so we can just already see that there's this uh, growth that's directed as well. The, this the tiny little human being grows at a rapid pace um, immediately after fertilization. You know, we talk about a clump of cells um, and I guess, you know, technically, uh, yes, they're a clump of cells. We are clumps of cells. We are still clumps of cells. Let's we are. I like, what, um, there's a pro-life activist um, named Amy Murphy who often says, I'm a large clump of cells advocating for smaller clumps of cells. Yep. I like that. I just yep. think that's we're, funny. We're pro-clumps. We, Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so that's one of my least favorite arguments in the entire like pro-choice dialogue of like, oh, it's just a clump of cells. Like, do you not remember like fourth grade biology? Cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make organ systems, organ systems make up organisms. So an entire organism, no matter whether that's a human being or a dog or whatever, they are, if you boil it back down, they're made of cells. It goes back and forth. So, I mean, that's that's how this all works. So just because something is made of cells doesn't mean that is not a distinct human organism. That is a huge point to drive home in these conversations because they will always say, well, the, the fetus is just part of the woman's body. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But it's important to realize that at the moment of fertilization, this is a distinct and individual human organism that is separate from the mother. Yes, definitely. And I think um, there, you know, there are seven criteria for, for life and, and what constitute an organism. And so I want to okay. look at those because- What are those seven yeah, things? Yeah, exactly. Right. They're really important because a, uh, a fetus, a fetal human being um, has all of these criteria and they meet what it means to be um, an, a human, an organism, a living organism, and they they have all of these. So I think they're important to note. So first of all, um, the first criteria is responsiveness to the environment. Okay. So, what does that mean? So um, they respond to stimuli um, happening around them. So um, of course, this gets a little maybe in, further into pregnancy. We can see some of these um, even more clearly. Um, but you know, unborn children um, will respond to loud sounds. They might jump in their mother's womb. Cool. All right. What's next? Um, growth and change. So this, that criteria, yep. Check. yeah, <laughs> makes yep. a lot yep. of sense. <laughs> yep. The the first um, level of development, um, you know, if we think of, you know, we talk about feed a fetus a lot, a fetal human being, um, a newborn human being, but going back further, um, the blastocyst stage of development is one of the first. Um, I think the zygotic stage of development happens right at fertilization, and then we move into the blastocyst stage very soon after that. Um, this is the most rapid time of change and growth in a human being's life. Um, you know, when fertilization occurs, uh, there's one cell human being immediately, and then it divides into two cells and then four cells. And so there's rapid growth. Right. Very obvious yeah. example. Uh, so check, we got All it. All right. Good one. Good human one. Life. Yeah. All right. Number three. Um, number three, ability to reproduce. So might not be as obvious, but um, the a child in the womb, and this happens maybe a little further into, um, into development, but um, a female child uh, will develop all the eggs um, that she will ever have um, in her life while she's in the womb. Um, all reproductive organs develop while in the womb. And so um, while they may not be matured yet, um, they are developing those. And so 
check. I think too, um, with the like reproduction one, and even some of these, you'll see that they will mature over time, like we took, like what we talked about. So with reproduction, like a like newborn children are not capable of reproducing, but that doesn't mean that they're not alive. It's very clear. So they, yeah. uh, the blueprint from the moment of fertilization is there to be able to reproduce. Yes. It just has to mature. Every species mm -hmm. has an age of reaching that point. Yeah. So yeah, it's absolutely. just differing, differing times. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's for go. Sure. Number four. Okay, number four, um, have a metabolism and breathe. Okay. So okay. Uh, the, the preborn child cannot breathe. So oh. it must, the, the human being must not be a human being, right? Yes. Right? Right, I guess no. so. No, not False. true. Um, the lungs of uh, a new human being in the womb start to develop very early on. And again, like we just mentioned, maturity, of course, doesn't happen until um, near birth. That's why sometimes premature babies um, have to, that are they're born prematurely, have to stay in the NICU for some time because their lungs aren't totally strong enough to right. um, support themselves uh, outside of the hospital. Um, but they do have that blueprint and their lungs do start to develop. Um, and also, um, while and a preborn child isn't maybe eating, uh, you know, solid food. Babies don't do that either. But um, they're maybe not eating uh, or nursing. You know, um, they are still um, receiving nutrients from the mother's body um, through the placenta, and so they have to um, metabolize and also um, just kind of uh, keep keep the preborn child's body um, functioning and growing and safe. Yeah. In its environment. So the preborn child is digesting and is yes. respirating, but it's not how we normally think of like, I'm going to take a bite of a hamburger and I'm going to like breathe. <sighs> exactly. So they're still doing that through the mother. And that's how it's supposed to be. That is yes. what every human being goes through in that stage of development. It's not a defect. Exactly. It's a normal, normal state of development. That's just how things develop. Exactly. As oh. you said, Kim, totally take true. That. <laughs> Number five is to maintain homeostasis. Kim, can you help us talk a little bit well, about that? Sorry, I'm I just no biologist. <laughs> I, it's all good. I'm good. Uh, it's all good. Well, I'm not a biologist, but uh, homeostasis is basically uh, maintaining kind of like an equilibrium throughout uh, the body. So like if I'm running a fever, my body's going to try to cool me down. Um, so that kind of thing. So just maintaining a normal level of um, like internal existence, I guess, is how I want to phrase that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The simplest distilling. Yes. There you go. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, thanks for that. Yeah. Number six is this one's very hard to, to understand. Being made of cells. What? We just talked about wow. this. <laughs> so you have to be a clump of cells in order to be a human being, actually. That is yeah. a requirement. To be alive, you must be a clump of cells. Isn't Boom. That, yeah, take that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Lay down the law. So okay. easy, check. Uh, the the preborn child is made of cells. Boom. Great, we got it. And then lastly, um, the ability to pass traits onto offspring. And we kind of talked about this as the ability to reproduce, but um, I just think it's fascinating that especially, you know, female children in the womb mm -hmm. develop all of the eggs that they will ever have. And so um, they're already, you know, producing those gametes that will pass on their traits to their offspring one day while they're in the womb. It's like inception, you know, yeah. it's like reproduction inception. It's almost <laughs> like this was all on purpose. Whoa. What? Designed yes. intelligently, perhaps? Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. So read those all again for the people at home just yes. to make Quick sure. Summary. Great. Uh, the preborn child has all seven characteristics, criteria for life. Yes. Number one, responsiveness to the environment. Number two, growth and change. Number three, the ability to reproduce. Number four, have a metabolism and breathe. Okay. Number five, maintain homeostasis. Number six, being made of cells. And number seven, passing traits onto offspring. Okay. So we've clearly established that the preborn child is alive. And time out real quick. I want to make sure that people know uh, you'll hear the terms thrown around of like fetus or embryo or preborn child, right. um, whatever that being is in the womb. I don't think we need to shy away from the scientific terms of embryo or fetus. And guess what else? The word fetus is Latin for little one. It's not a word for like some other kind of species. Fetus means a stage of life, a little one of the same species. So if the unborn child has human parents and is alive, 
that means that this is an alive human being, no matter if they're a zygote, embryo, fetus, newborn, toddler, what have you. So we've laid out the clear case that the preborn child is alive. Boom, mic drop. Yes, but when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about does that, just because someone is alive, does that make them a person? Because whenever you have these conversations, you know, you'll lay out the case of, yes, life begins at conception. So then they'll say, okay, well, I'm convinced that, uh, that this is alive, but that doesn't make it a human or that makes it, that maybe they're a human, but they have less rights. So we're gonna talk about that in a second and how to refute all of those arguments in making the pro-life case. Texas Right to Life is facing 14 lawsuits from Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. They're suing us because we helped pass the Texas Heartbeat Act. And they're trying to scare us pro-lifers into backing down. Please join us in the fight against Planned Parenthood and donate to protect the Texas Heartbeat Act. You can fight for the unborn and build a pro-life Texas that values every human life. Go to texasrighttolife.com slash lawsuit to make your contribution. Every cent will help and it's greatly appreciated. Social media companies are hiding pro-life content from you. Fight back against big tech. Text PRO-LIFE to 40237 for direct access to the best pro-life news. Since 2019, our web traffic has been down 90% because of big tech censorship. Stay ahead of the censors. When you text PRO-LIFE to 40237, you're in control, not some algorithm telling you what you can and cannot see. Join now, text PRO-LIFE to 40237. Welcome back, friends. And so personhood being different from alive. Now, in my brain, this is always the weirdest uh, kind of argument. Like, well, yeah, it's alive, but it's not really a person. It's like, but what, then what is it? Right. Come on, guys. Right. When do you magically become a person? Like it. They get into weird subjective terms and then the line goes everywhere. So, but let's talk about what personhood, what is it? How does this work? Mm -hmm. How can we define this? Well, I think when you're having conversations with people, like you said, uh, people will define personhood in a million different ways. And I think it all comes down to um, just like different criteria. So, you know, when we've been out on campus before, any of our fellows could tell you when they've right. been tabling on campus and they have these conversations, <clears throat> they'll ask their, you know, the person they're dialoguing with, probably the pro-choice person across the table from them, um, you know, what, a, what, can, what do you consider personhood? And they'll say things like, well, sentience, you know, the ability to, to be aware of oneself, um, the ability to care for, for yourself. Uh, you know, a, a, a fetus can't survive outside of its mother's womb. So therefore not a person. Um, they'll come up, you know, with all, all kinds of different criteria. Those are just a few examples. Right, right. And I would like to point out too that Anytime we try to draw these subjective lines of who gets rights, because the real question of personhood is, do you have rights? Do you have value? The, that's really what we're talking about. So we've already established that the prenatal human being is alive and is a human, but does that make them a person with rights and value? So we're talking about, um, do, does the unborn child's right to life, is that uh, equal? How does that compare to the, mother, uh, the mother's bodily autonomy? Because every person has the right to their own body. It's true. We're talking about a separate body now is the question with abortion, that the mother has indeed has the right to her own body. And now does she have the right to um, control somebody else's body, the preborn child in that child's life? So how do these compare? So whenever we try to draw these distinctions of this person has rights, but this one doesn't, uh, especially when it comes to the right to life, that has ended in some very catastrophic outcomes throughout human history. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Once you start drawing lines of this one has value and this one doesn't, the guy drawing that line has way too much power. Exactly. Slavery, the Holocaust, any genocide you can look at, that is what happens of just dehumanizing that, um, you know, this, this may be a human, but they're not a person. And so that's what's happening right now with the question of abortion. 
Right. Yeah. Leads to eugenics. Uh, absolutely. Yep. And and I don't think many people who would consider themselves pro-choice uh, have been perhaps intellectually honest and, and followed that um, that thought to its logical conclusion that exactly what you said, anytime you start to, to, uh, say this person is human, but this person is not. And to draw those lines, um, yeah, you're, we're, we're looking at eugenics. Yeah. Yeah. And so every single time that this issue of personhood is brought up of when does human life have value? When does this person have their own rights? Usually the uh, pro-choice friend that you're talking to will create these lines in four different ways. And this is actually an opportunity for us because in terms of um, you know, the difference between the preborn child and you or me, there's only four main differences here and none of them affect the value of the human being. There's the size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. This spells SLED. So just remember SLED. I tell my youth ministry kids this all the time because I know they're having these conversations. Um, so the preborn child is smaller than us. They are less developed than us. They're in a different environment and they're more dependent than we are. But do those characteristics make you non-human? No, I don't think so. Well, first of all, talking about size. So we're sitting right now, but when we stand, Brent is a very tall gentleman. Yes. Um, Kim and I are on the oh, probably more slightly average more side. vertically challenged. We than actually, I am. we I get confused for you all the time. Really? So about, about we are high. equal in human okay. worth, but Brent. But <laughs> if we want to go by size, I guess. How right. tall are you? Six? Uh, six, six, one, okay. something like that. Depending on what convenience store I'm walking exactly. in. <laughs> so uh, does Brent, being several, several inches taller than Kim and I, uh, does that make you more human? More more of a person than me or Kim? If a murderer... Gotta have to say no. If someone but... walked in and murdered, like, all of us, would it be less of a crime if they murdered us versus le murdering Brent. It's like, oh, well, he was bigger. Like, I guess that's a bigger deal that he murdered you. I don't like no. where this is going, yes. guys. This is, why <laughs> are we murdering like, us? I'm this is sorry. weird. That's, but that's the question of abortion. If, if someone is smaller, is it more or less okay to kill them? No. Right. Yeah, okay, so okay. size. So size, size is irrelevant in, in murder. Yes. So right. here we go. Thank exactly. you. So the next in SLED, the, the acronym, um, the next letter is L, and that is level of development. So okay. we have a coworker who's about to come back from maternity leave, and uh, she has been bringing her newborn daughter to the office for us to visit and see her, and um, she's adorable. It's been so fun. Yeah. Our, yes. our office kind of shut, we keep working, but we kind of shut down when a baby comes because yes. we're a pro-life group. and. We get like we get super, baby. super yes. baby tunnel vision. Um, high pitched voices down the hallways because right. they're talking to the baby. It's, it's so awesome. Um, but her her child uh, needs a lot of care. She's a newborn. She's only yeah. been been um, outside of the womb for several weeks. Yeah. Um, she's definitely not as developed as any of us right. here, um, but that doesn't make her any less of a person does yeah. it? No, exactly. Nope. And I would like to point out too, that people who make this argument of if you're less developed and this, uh, this argument can kind of take different shapes. They might just, they might not just say, oh, they're less developed. It might be something specific. Well, they don't have brain waves yet. And I would like to point out actually that the preborn child has brain waves very early in about this six weeks. True. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyways, they'll say, oh, the preborn child can't think or they're not self-aware, they'll list some kind of marker for how developed you are. All of this just falls under the umbrella of development. So you can use this at any point. So just because you're less developed doesn't make you less human. Uh, I'd yep. like to point out too that the human brain doesn't finish developing until well into your 20s. Yes. So with that said, uh, a lot of these college kids making these little uh, Instagram arguments because like like young people aren't on Facebook. Um, <laughs> not as much anymore. TikTok, so, yes, so those angry making... tweets are coming from people who are not completely developed. Yes, yes. yes. All of these arguments are coming from people who are less developed than uh, perhaps any of us. So it, does that make it okay? Weirdly, to... again, I'm the most developed one in the room. That, wow. And that's... <laughs> Brent, that's just By your privilege. By being the token old guy in the room. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> this, 
It's okay, okay. Brent. It's That's... okay. So level of development does not change your human worth. And this really just comes, this mostly yeah. comes in the form of people like doing some kind of bulleted list of characteristics they think that make you human, like sentience or mm -hmm. um, uh, self-awareness. And those are characteristics of development, but they're not a crux of, are you a human? Are you not? Are you a person with rights or are you not? Because then we get into the sliding scale of, does that mean someone who is less developed has less rights? Is it more okay to kill a toddler than a teenager? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and um, I think we've y'all talked about Peter Singer on oh, the yeah. podcast before. He's a couple times. Yeah, uh, out of out of Princeton, um, a philosopher, and he he argues um, he at least is intellectually honest and and consistent in that he says. Um, no, because, uh, you know, a two year old is is not as developed. Um, you should be able to to kill them. Yeah. And so I think even even, um, you know, your next door neighbor who's pro choice and wants to have these conversations with you, hopefully they could see just how asinine those the that argument would be. You would think so. But there are states trying to push such laws that perinatal, which is kind of undefined, mm -hmm when it ends, could be uh, 30 days old, could be pushed into two years. They want to push perinatal abortion. Um, California. Yeah, yeah, sounds absolutely insane, but there are people who are on that end of the spectrum in their belief. And yeah, they're wrong, yes. but <laughs> yeah, they're, they exist. Right, and that is the logical conclusion though. We've talked about this right. of, if you believe that a preborn child has less rights because they're less developed and there's certain markers of they have to be self-aware or what, whatever you want to say on that, you have to draw that to its logical end of if a newborn or a toddler or uh, maybe somebody who's a patient in a hospital, they're in a coma, right. is it okay to deprive that person of their right to life? No. Or what if they're just special needs and yeah. they're just not... Right functioning quite on the level that we consider to be normal, whatever normal is. Right. Like you that's that's a problem. That's where you start getting into terrible, terrible things that yep. people have done in history. Every time. Every, every time. Every time we get, we get in these slippery intellectual slopes. But you know what's good for slippery intellectual slopes? I don't know. Sleds. Hey. <laughs> okay. So can... remember sled. Oh my gosh. Brent. How do we go up from there, Brent? I don't know. Okay, let's about, go to environment. How about environment? Okay. Environment. E. e. Okay. Well, obviously, the preborn child, uh, you know, resides in his or her mother's womb. Um, it is not he or she is not here in the outside world with us. And for some reason, that seems to be a place that or that that criteria for being, uh, you know, living in a different environment. Um, some people think that that is a reason we should be able to to kill them, which I think is is outrageous because, you know, I live I live in Dallas. I work out of our North Texas office uh, for Texas Right to Life. You guys live here in Houston, work in our Houston headquarters. Um, does my worth differ from your you're not, worth. You're I mean, not less Houston of a co-worker. Co I mean, you know, Houston you know, and there. Dallas have some some hard feelings sometimes. But <laughs> I don't we have think little meme that you're wars. Less human because, or less of a person, yeah. because you live in Dallas. Right. The thing with I think that environment is the weakest argument of these. Um, and I hope I hope our pro-choice friends will agree. But you still hear this so often. Of well, obviously the fetus is part of the woman's body because. They're in the woman's body. Oh, big brain. Guess what? I'm in this building. I'm not part of this building. <laughs> and so like you have to acknowledge this, that the eight inch trip down the birth canal does not magically turn you into a human being. And uh, we've referenced this video before. It's called the Magical Birth Canal. You can find it on our website, texasrighttolife.com. We'll throw um, a link in the description. It's so <laughs> funny. And so it just like illustrates how ridiculous this argument is of being, you know, this far out from being in the womb versus out of the womb doesn't change uh, whether you're a person or not. And sometimes the viability argument, whether the child can survive outside of the womb falls under this. And the problem with that is viability, whether the child can survive outside or not, doesn't depend on his or her, the child's own worth. That depends on what kind of technology we have available to care for that True. child. Right. So their value is determined externally, not intrinsically. 
And I think that's one of the biggest flaws of that argument, because if we're talking about human worth, it must be intrinsic and environment is not going to change that. OK, no. say say you have a terrible accident and you're in a hospital and you're in life support and you cannot leave the building. If you exit the building, you're dead. Yes. OK, but if we let you heal there and continue for a little while, you can leave the building and be just fine. Wow. Are shocking. you less of a person while you're in the hospital? No, exactly. That's no. A, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, so environment, you know, doesn't change what you are or who you are. I'm not a different person if I walk out of this building. The preborn child genetically is not different once they travel outside of the womb. Exactly. Nope. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Exactly. So talking about viability, you know, even children who's uh, preborn children whose mothers maybe reside in deep West Texas, where Kim's from. Yeah. Um, right. Right. Like yeah. I live out in the sticks. Like there's not like there's hospitals out there, but it's nothing. There's like not a major medical center. Exactly. Yes. It's not like the world renowned medical center in, in Houston. Um, those children in, in the womb in West Texas that are further from those great resources, um, you know, if they're born prematurely, um, they don't have access to that. And it, whereas, you know, maybe a pregnant woman here in Houston has access to the med center, um, right. you know, does her, does that child in the womb in Houston matter more, have more personhood, have more rights than right. the preborn child in West Texas? And right. The answer is no. They're more likely to survive if they're, yes. uh, they have access to this very sophisticated hospital system. But, and this child in, out in the sticks is not, as likely to survive, but they're both human beings of equal worth. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Now, that is kind of a good segue on degree of dependency. Mm. This one I think is really interesting. I love having this conversation. So degree of dependency, people will say, you know, the preborn child is not a person because they completely rely on their mother and their mother's body, the woman's body for um, sustenance and protection. And um, therefore they are not a person. Lies lies. Yeah. So I ridiculous. think this one cracks me up too, because like whenever I was in college, I would hear this from college kids and it's like, do your parents pay for your tuition? <laughs> Are they helping you in any way? Are you in Are they still paying all of your bills? Right. <laughs> hmm. It sounds like you're a little bit dependent. Does that make you not a person? Yeah. No, just because you're dependent on another. And I would argue that the entire human family is dependent on another on other people. And that's how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to live in community and rely on other people. You're not supposed to do everything yourself. But uh, physically, yes, the preborn child is dependent on the mother for everything. And guess what else? Have you ever had a newborn? Right. Exactly. I, you know, we were talking about our coworker who's been on maternity leave. Her daughter uh, is very dependent on her. You know, Shock. even even what eight Shock, weeks? I say. I know. Even eight <laughs> weeks later, if 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 we were to, you know, leave her here in the office one day, this this baby, you know, she comes to visit, and and uh, we just decide to to leave her here. She can she can take care of herself until tomorrow morning when we get no, back. No, that would be ridiculous. That's called abandonment and yes. neglect. And guess what? You're going to get arrested and you're going to go to jail if you do that. Right. So same kind of thing. If you uh, and the parent has a different role too in this, like if the parent has a responsibility, the parent has a covenant with this child to make sure that uh, they're giving everything that this very dependent child needs. And, um, you know, if the parent just randomly decides to sever that and doesn't try to place the child for adoption or the safe havens, baby Moses laws, where you can go to a fire station and drop your baby off because you it's too much to take care of this situation, right. um, then that's a different situation. You're doing your rightful duty of making sure that child is taken care of, even if you're not capable of doing that uh, with but different situation if like what you're talking about if you just leave a child uh and a parent just leaves a child and does nothing to uh provide what that child needs you're going to get arrested with uh, abandonment and neglect and that rightfully you should because that relationship is so important and so those same principles apply with the child in the womb and even if the mother uh can't 
parent the child. Let's say that they're, this mother's in college and um, she's got so much on her plate, she cannot be a parent. Well, there's adoption, there's baby Moses laws. There are other opportunities besides ending the life of the preborn child. Yeah, definitely. And even, you know, we've been talking about babies, newborns, young children, um, but even thinking about maybe older, older children, older people who um, perhaps have a, a intellectual disability or physical disability um, and, and cannot care for, them, care for themselves, can't live alone. Right. Um, you know, does, does a, you know, a 30 year old person who maybe was in um, a car accident and is paralyzed from the neck down, a quadriplegic, do, do they have less rights, less personhood on URI because they are dependent on caregivers um, for their care, for their life? No. Yeah. And I think we would all agree the more vulnerable a person is, the more we have a responsibility to take care of them and uh, protect their rights because they may not be able to fight for themselves, whether that's people with disabilities, children, pre-born children, uh, vulnerable elderly uh, people that if the more vulnerable somebody is, the more we have a responsibility, all of us, to stand up for their rights. And so this idea that just because somebody is more vulnerable, somebody uh, has is more dependent on another, you wouldn't say that like you were talking about for somebody who uh, is very uh, intensely disabled. And if you follow that line of thinking to its logical conclusions, that's what you're going to end up with. And I invite all of our pro-choice friends, if that is the line that they want to follow. Yeah. Kim, would you say you're dependent on farmers? I am. I would say all of us are uh, very, very dependent how, on how farmers. How dare you need food from somebody else? I'm sorry. I'll try to do better and not need food or water or clothing or shelter. shelter. Exactly. It's like we're dependent on our jobs. We're dependent right. on farmers. We're Did you build on... your own house? Did you sew your own clothes? <laughs> Did, Did you, you grow your own food? Sounds like you're awfully dependent. Right. I don't know. Even, even you know, since, since the pandemic has started several years ago and we've seen staffing shortages at, you know, various your restaurants, retail establishments, I mean, kind of across the board, right? Um, that can frustrate consumers. And again, say we're dependent on people in the service industry, people, you know, who who provide various um, goods for us. And and yeah, it's, it's important. So, and I think you said something earlier too about um, we're all dependent on someone in some way. Yep. Um, humans are inherently relational. You know, that's kind of a reflection of, of the Trinity as well. Um, you know, the Trinity, they all share love between each other, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, and they're relational. And that's one way that humans are, one, just one of the ways the humans are made in the image of God is that we also are relational. And um, and I love what you said about the vulnerable deserve more protection. That's just a way that we, we show that relationality between human beings is by caring for the most vulnerable in our mm -hmm. society. Yeah. And that's how it's supposed to be. You know, we are created for community. We are created to love one another. And that's, again, like I said, I think last week on the podcast that the pro-life question is not either or. It's always both and. Whenever we lift each other up in all segments of life, whether it's these conversations that we're having with our neighbors or the actual real issue of abortion of does this child have a right to life and what can I do to protect him or her? That whenever we strive to lift each other up in that way, the entire society is moving in the positive direction. We are all lifted up when we do that. And so that's why it's important to have these conversations. That's why it's important to be involved in the pro-life movement and work toward that goal because we it affects us all. It affects everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good chat, guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, that acronym, SLED, yes. size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency. Oh, Always. wait, wait, I wanted to add a thing. Oh. I'm sorry, okay, time out. So degree, <laughs> I'm, we, you thought we were done, you yeah. thought. Okay, on, you might ask like, why is it degree of dependency, not just dependency? Well, it's because we pointed out everyone is dependent on another. It just varies in degree. So the preborn child is likely the most dependent segment of our society. Right. But we never grow out of being dependent. We are all dependent on uh, other people. And so that's why it's called degree of dependency. Okay, so repeat that again. Yes, exactly, Kim. Uh, SLED, 
S is for size, L is for level of development, E is for environment, D is for degree of dependency. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're done. Cool, okay. <laughs> well, okay, that's it for this week, right? Great chat, guys. Hopefully we all learned something useful. And now we can take that, share that with our friends and family, you know, change some hearts and minds and save some lives. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.